Hey everyone, it's Norm from Tested and happy Friday. I'm wrapping up this week, sharing with you the best thing, my favorite thing I saw this week. Uh, among the many things I collect, I collect pop culture screen prints and posters from companies like Mondo, Bottleneck Gallery, Gallery 1988. These are poster companies and shops that work with really talented artists and illustrators to create officially licensed screen prints and posters inspired and based on our favorite pop culture movies and icons. And one of those artists is Daniel Danger, whose work I love. I have a few of his pieces. It's beautiful and haunting and a perfect use of screen printing. And he just announced and revealed this week a new officially licensed Star Wars piece in collaboration with Bottleneck Gallery. It's something unlike anything I've seen before in the poster space because it's not one print, but it's a series of prints combined into a shadow box, a three-dimensional piece of artwork representing and a perfect use of his style. And in fact, he prototyped and is making all of these pieces, all these shadow box pieces, using a home laser cutter, a glow forge that he picked up watching tested videos. So he actually reached out to us and I got in touch. So what you're about to watch right now is a conversation I had with Daniel, learning about his process, how he prototyped this piece, and me just fanboying out about his screen prints. Please enjoy. So I am now super excited to be joined by Daniel Danger, who reached out over social media just yesterday, uh, over Twitter. And I've, I've been such a big fan of your work over the years. And it turns out you watch tested videos. So yes, religiously. This is, like, this is, this is a, a lot of happy things coming together, yeah. things converging. But first of all, uh, congratulations on the launch of this print. Thank um, you. And I, I want to kind of pick your brain about the design, about your artwork. But for people who don't know your art, can you kind of talk about uh, your work as an illustrator, as a, as a printmaker, um, and, and how you would describe your own style? Sure. Um, so I work primarily in silk screen. Um, I, right out of high school, I, wor I started working in a t-shirt shop and just kind of like fell in love with ink and such and went to school for printmaking and illustration. And uh, I've kind of just merged those things together over the years. Um, my work, I would probably describe it as it's very much about like an environment and a space and like kind of a narrative uh, kind of interjected in that. It tends to be very kind of quiet, somber, dreamy sort of um, scenes rooted in like, uh, a, a, you know, abandoned New England kind of old, you know, uh, quiet suburbs, ghosts. It's it's kind of a very particular sort of thing. I always, I've kind of joked for years that it's sort of like, I grew up on like Sierra point and click adventure games and it's like not dissimilar to those. It's like a panoramic with a big scene with one little lone character kind of walking around and like a line of dialogue on the bottom, which is sort of like the trademark of, of my work. And part of, I think what makes it um, really embrace that dreamlike aspect is the the coloring that you use mm -hmm. and which ties into the screen printing process yeah. for people who may not understand how that process works. It's not like a, a CMYK print yeah. or a color print. You as a designer have to think about layers. Is that correct? In terms yeah. of how you, uh, how you comp compose the image. Screen printing is a very binary art form in that there's, you know, a mesh that has a stencil on it and the ink goes through or doesn't. So either in every tiny little, little tiny dot, there's either ink or no ink, there's no gradients. So in order to like make full color images, you're really just using a ton of colors. It's not like CMYK where it's just four or like an expanded like with like, you know, like modern jet ink printers, like, I tend to work in a monotone or duotone color palettes because that's sort of a limitation of the art form um, to build up a couple layers of progressively darker blues and then add like a spot red or like have a background that's like a bright yellow and then slowly stack colors on top of it until it gets to like, you know, a vibrant green or something like you uh, you're limited to not just like nine colors, um, but how those colors stack, how they can, how you can make one transparent. Like it's kind of, it, it sort of turns uh, everything into a big giant logic puzzle, which I really enjoy. Like how do yeah, I make, yeah. how do I make eight colors look like a full, you know, a full tonal range. And, and I, I noticed some screen print artists, they, they try to 
really lean into that and embrace that the whole the the alignment and the registration of their layers some mm-hmm. try to you know emulate some or create some gradients and there's a distinct look to kind of yeah. the speckling of the art but like you said it's not just cmyk they can choose some entire pantone library of colors yeah. and so you're you're choosing colors you're choosing layers these and by creating some limitations like you said then then you uh your your design constraints allow you to explore a lot of different spaces in that yeah yeah i i really i really enjoy the process and like i i like using very um i think that adds to sort of like the dreamlike quality as you said is that to use very like overly slightly saturated vibrant colors um and you know like um you know, people always kind of tease me because they're like, how many blueprints can you do? And I'm like, well, the sky is blue. Like, that's just what it is. It's like, but finding that right kind of, the right kind of cerulean that feels like, this feels like dusk. Like this feels like, mm. you know, uh, a red sky right before, like, you know, right before the sunsets, like really nailing in those things and then building a piece kind of out from those colors. Like, you know, colors are powerful. The same thing, they kind of, they'll, trigger those same notions of like nostalgia and, and mood and atmosphere and narrative and all that. And it's just, it's just fun to play with. <laughs> well, let's talk about this piece in particular, because it's different. It's a, yeah. it's a shadow box piece. There's dimensionality to it. But when I, I first saw it in many ways, I thought your art style was so perfect for it because like in screen printing, you have to think about the layers here. There are literal layers, yeah, yeah. but also <laughs> compounded with, screen printed pieces first. So c- from a kind of structural standpoint, can you talk yeah. about you know, how many layers and, and and how this combines both screen printing as well as uh, laser cutting? Yeah, so the, this you know typical screen print would just be a piece of paper and one ink layer, another ink layer, and you just kind of keep building it up and building up. And it kind of looks like a topographical map in you know really short scale. So I the, the, the depth that I try to create with my work is really important. It's kind of like the signature aspect of it. And when, you know, COVID stuff hit, production stuff really slowed down. It was like, in order to get something printed, it was now taking three times as long, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I started kind of looking at like, well, what is some, what is some machinery or something that I can get into my studio that I can make something in house, even a short runs. Like, so I'm not reliant on my printer who lives across the country. So I started playing, I started looking at Glowforge videos and thinking like, what can I do with this? It's kind of affordable and, you know, consumer friendly. Cause I'm not a very tech oriented guy. I mean, like the wall behind me is filled with like 40 year old electronics. Like that's more my speed. Um, so I started thinking about like, well, I really liked dioramas as a kid. I liked parallax motion of like, you know, like the old Disney films, the panes of glass moving, like that stuff is always really fascinating to me. So I thought, well, like, what if I screen print those layers and then use a Glowforge to cut them out and then stack them with spacers? And I I did like a trial run of this last year for like a for a gallery show they did in Chicago with like personal work, like not pop culture stuff. And I just did three layers and I like I was like, oh, this is great. Like I have to like, what can I do with this? Um, yeah. So I started thinking, all right, well, I uh Dagobah. I wanted to just do Dagobah. I wanted to do Star Wars. Like, you know, it's been a while since I've done like a, you know, a, a licensed pop culture piece. And I was like, Dagobah, it's perfect. It's all vines and trees and, and stacks of layers. So I started, um, you know, these are, these are some of the, uh, the cut layers, wow. um, how they work. Like, so this is, I think a six color screen print. I'll put a background behind it. Um, you know, this six, six color screen print that's then laser cut with Glowforge and you know, that stacks on top of, um, you know, this slightly farther background one. Yeah. So you just kind of build these up and build these up. And there's a front layer on this whole thing, too. But, um, and then you kind of get that same thing, like what, we, what we're familiar with, with those like kind of Disney movies, where things have a, a very gentle movement to it. Um, that's exactly how they I, I mean i was thinking how as one very theatrical almost like uh the frame of the print is like the proscenium of a, yeah. a theater right but the, the way you talk about it um disney animation literally had painted slides yeah and they had a, a they created parallax by moving the camera while there was a big distance between yeah um and those the, those the machines frames. watching footage of that stuff get made is is like mind-blowing yeah. and like 
that's always stuck in my head. And I, you know, the same thing with like, you know, once again, the, the old Sierra games, there was a little aspect of that kind of motion with that stuff. And I loved that. And I thought, well, like, how can I make that like in paper form? How can I like do that? And so, you know, the finished piece is, you know, wow. I'm gonna try to do it. It's, I got some glare here, but um, it's, we built these, uh, I work with this frame shop in Rhode Island um, and we're, it's like a custom built shadow box and there's four layers, uh, 18 total screen printed colors across the four layers. And then between each layer is a, um, a like custom cut, uh, like f black foam spacer that kind of gives it that depth. And it just kind of sits on your wall. And as you, it's, you've got a little bit of that, like, as you walk, it moves a little bit, it feels a little real and it's got, um, you know, actual depth to it versus like, you know, just illustrated depth, you know. I think the marriage of illustration and laser cutting adds so much to it because I've seen other shadow boxes that are purely laser cut, you know, whether it's yeah. of wood or, or or paper and you know, you have depth there, but you know, you have to kind of really add 10, 20, 30 layers. Yeah. Uh, that, which then becomes a ton of a ton of <laughs> you know, limits your you in other ways or in terms of how much space yeah. you can have between them. Uh, but here you're combining like even though it's it's like four layers because you have that front piece, mm -hmm. they're screen printed. You said 18 yeah. different colors. Yeah. So you're getting basically four prints. And yeah. then <laughs> you kind of chose where the gaps and the holes were. It wasn't just like you know, coming from the top, you see holes in the bottom underneath that X wing. Yeah. And, and talk about that process of figuring that out. I mean, it had to be, it was an interesting thing to figure out because it had to be not just illustrative, but it had to be structural because it's laser cut, you're cutting holes. You can't have free floating, just like things sticking everywhere. So like every single little line and branch had to be connected on both ends. It had to be supportive. The whole thing had to kind of hold itself up. Um, so it was the same sort of thing. Like, how do I make it so um, the whole thing's you know, like holds together, like when, with, without being fully supportive, because a lot of it has like these foam core spacers in between the layers, which give it some structure. Um, but there's also lots of like loose branches and vines and such. So it was, it right. was really, it was difficult to figure out how to make this like stable almost and that make something that could be cut. I mean, the, the Glowforge can do really fine lines. Um, but if there's not a larger thing kind of holding it together, it does get kind of weird. Um, so it was kind of like, especially with my illustration work, I'm always kind of thinking, um, I, I tend to draw um, like, you know, uh, dark to light, honestly, like um, most people's brains, like if, uh, this is a hard thing to explain, but like, if you have a piece of paper, uh, like a white piece of paper and you're drawing with a pen, you're always drawing shadows. Like that's what's happening my brain kind of flips the opposite. Like I tend to draw with light. Like I want to draw on black paper with, you know, a white marker or whatever. So I had to kind of think about you typically when I'm drawing, I'm drawing starting dark and kind of building up the highlights. Um, and this way I had to start thinking, all right, well, the lights behind everything, but I have to be able yeah. to like draw what's behind the trees. You know, it's it's kind of a hard thing to explain, but like thinking about where the light source in this thing is, how it actually functions, um, I, it's 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 still a lot to wrap my <laughs> head around. Um, and yeah, like I said, it was it was interesting drawing a piece where I had to think if I drew a tree, well, what's behind the tree? I actually have to think about that now. How does the lighting work there? Because in this in this case, you're doing a piece where you can look around something. Um, yeah, which is yeah. So interesting. Draw beyond, right, yeah. beyond what normally would be your stack layers. Yeah. in addition to what's normally uh, obscured. Yeah, so there was like four, four stacked layers. You know, four individual things that I had to kind of think about. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it took a lot of trial and error, and we eventually kind of figured it out, and um, then had to kind of make the systems and how and which to cut it because, you know. The Glowforge is an excellent machine, but you can't just put a piece of paper in it and cut it. It doesn't actually work that way. Um, <laughs> you it, have to have registration, right? Like if you're, yeah. if, if, if it's not just a black and white or, you know, a single clone, right? You're getting from your printer uh, a, a screen printed, you know, um, element, a layer. But when you throw that in a laser cutter, it needs to be perfect aligned. Yeah. So it doesn't, you have, it, to have like some type of jig or something. It doesn't have a target on it. Like you, you can't just like, you can't tell the the Glowforge to like aim at this and start like, you know, screen printing itself is, uh, is a really 
inconsistent medium, string stretch and move slightly. So every single piece that we have is slightly off in a slightly different way. There's different registration. Mm -hmm. And you can talk about just a little, you know, like half a millimeter, but that can be enough to kind of throw things off when you're doing really fine lines here. Um, and, you know, if you put a piece of paper, even a piece of cardstock in the Glowforge and hit cut, and you start cutting out little tiny pieces, the giant fan is sending those pieces everywhere. They're flying around, yeah. they're landing where, you know, they land and then the laser goes back over it and it like doesn't cut right. And um, so we had to kind of make these whole systems, like we, we custom built vacuum tables to fit inside this. Um, initially I found a, found a guy who could, yeah, so they would just hold, suck the paper down and when the laser cut it, it wouldn't move, it wouldn't fly away. Mm. It wouldn't, and it also keep it kept the paper from like bubbling up and causing being out of focus and all this such. So we went through two different versions of laser. Uh, sorry, we went through two different versions of vacuum tables. We had the first version that uh, a guy helped me with, um, and then we kind of improved on that, improved on that, um, and then eventually um, my my buddy who's been helping me with all this, um, he just came in one day and he's like, "I got a whole new thing." <laughs> like. But, uh, Amazing. Yeah, just a lot of like developing systems in which to do something that this wasn't really designed to do. Yeah, and adapting the artwork, which has the aesthetic of this in mind, but now creating that yeah. physical uh, aspect of it. Did you do like any overprinting in the design just to give yourself a little bit of buffer yes. for alignment and registration? So when I did the the first pieces I did last year, um, I didn't consider that kind of in, in, in screen printing world. It's called trapping. It's basically you mm. extend the ink past the point of where it's going to be hidden. So basically, if there's like a, a black layer and a blue layer, you don't just butt them up against each other because it's never actually going to happen. You kind of sink the blue one underneath. Um, and I found that with the last ones I did, I didn't, I, I kind of just thought like, oh, the laser's accurate. It's going to be fine. But it wasn't always. It was always a little bit. So I kind of felt that like, um, you know, a good example is on, on, on Luke here. I had to, he's a little bit brighter than the rest of it. He has this kind of orange color. So I had to take the color around him and kind of really stretch it out. So in case the laser moved a little bit, um, it was still a clean line. It wasn't like there was no ghosting or anything. Um, yeah, this, this was all like trial and error, like um, things you wouldn't even think to have to do. Uh, like, you know, we would we would come in and go. There's a problem today. I guess we're they're spending all day solving this one problem. Totally, that's the fun part. I think. Yeah, that's I, the fun, of this prototyping, it's like the process reveals, you know, things that you never consider, but also yeah. a result that you may not have envisioned. Yeah, I mean, I've been working in screen printing for for almost 20 years now. I mean, right out of high school, and I know that medium really, really well at this point. I mean, I have hundreds of print releases at this point. It's all I've been doing every single day, so I know. I know like basically everything there is to know about print preparation for this medium and what it can do and what it can't do and how to correct these things. And I don't have to do a lot of problem solving in my day to day. It's just sort of like doing what I do. So this project was really fun because for the last, I mean, we've been working on this on and off for about nine months now. Um, it was really fun to come in here, like me and, and my buddy and just like, um, to, we're going to not, not only are we going to like solve a problem, we're going to find a problem and then solve <laughs> it because we don't want to find a problem when we're, you know, 400 cuts in and then suddenly something fails. So it was a lot of like, you know, things you would never even think to check for, like just, you know, the, the vacuum table as the more it cuts, the less pressure there is on it. It starts rising a little bit. Then the laser gets out of focus. How do we solve that? Um, that was really fun. I mean, just, I don't, I don't, I don't get challenged in the medium that I work in very often anymore. And this was nonstop challenges left, you know, left and right beginning to end. Um, and we're still coming up, we're still finding problems. And then your fans get to appreciate your work in a, di in a different way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. yeah. I know you still have fulfillment and you're still, you're, you, there's still the orders that you, that you have to, to make and all the variants. Um, but as you're kind of putting an end to this project, uh, are you thinking about this process going forward for future art pieces in, in a series or yeah. in this world and other worlds? Yeah. I mean, I think um, the trick with it is that like 
I don't think I want to do a series of just Star Wars or something like that, but I do like this format because it's sort of, um, it's a little bit theatrical. It's a little bit stage set up. It's a little bit like, you know, I, you think about, um, maybe this is like the former drama club kid in me, but like, you know, this is a stage, this is a scene and how do I stack yeah. it? Um, and I think that's, it's very playful in a way that doesn't necessarily fit my own personal work, but it does fit this, like, you know, the movie scenes really well. And like, I always kind of joke that like, whenever I do a movie poster, I I'm always, the thing I want to draw in every film is the quiet, sad scene where nothing's happening. And I've got plenty of those. So like, I want to, <laughs> I want to like go and do like, you know, go to some of these other films that I grew up in and loved and find those like, you know, when I say scene, I mean like environment, the, the location and like what would fit this process really well. So like, and just have fun with it and, and not um, like ha- do the jungle temple from Indiana Jones, do the, you know, the, the skeleton piano organ from the Goonies, like go to some class. Like I, I see it in my head so clearly, but like night of the hunter with the kid in the bar and looking at the, like the horse on the hill, like I can do this and have it really kind of feel like you're looking into like kind of these original movie scenes, but in my illustrative style and such. Um, so I have, yeah. I have a lot of really like big plans for it. <laughs> yeah. And then for you, it becomes a nice process of discovery as well. Yeah. Where you get to, when it's finished, get to see something where you know, even in, in screen printing that you're so familiar with, it's yeah. revealed in a different way. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to spend, awesome. I'm probably going to spend a couple of years refining this process a little bit more and more. Um, I mean, where we started a year ago and where we, where we are now are just totally different. Um, and I'm excited, like I said, just, just as I, I don't get, you know, I don't get challenged very much. And this is a challenge for me. And I'm like really enjoying that again. Well, we appreciate it and appreciate yeah. your time as well. Um, thank you so much for yeah, reaching for out me. and for, for sharing your work and congratulations on, on this launch. And we can't wait to see yeah. the future uh, iterations yeah, of this yeah. format. Thanks. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation, and it was clear to me that this project was such a labor of love for Daniel that got him through this past year, a new creative endeavor for him to push the limits of his artwork and take all that knowledge and experience that he has with screen printing and combine it with some new frontiers and prototyping with laser cutting. It's a really great example of what talented artists can do with new technologies and a perfect convergence of all things that we love on Tested. Uh, This piece called Will He Finish What He Begins is still on sale as of now. It's an open edition until the end of this weekend. So I'll include a link below to Bottleneck Gallery where you can check it out if you're interested. I have mine pre-ordered. But once again, thank you for watching and thank Daniel for reaching out and chatting with me and geeking out about screen prints. Hope you all have a wonderful weekend, and I'll see you next time. Bye.